You're now experiencing data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. Hey everyone, Brian here with Experiencing Data. And on this episode, I'm going to interview Jim Pasota of Panjiva. Panjiva is an enterprise data product SaaS company that provides analytics and insights on the global supply chain. Jim's going to talk to us about three things to get right when you're creating a data product. He's also going to go into some of the lessons that he's learned from their early days, starting from a data perspective versus starting from a customer perspective. They've recently been acquired as well. So I'm going to let Jim talk about his journey with Panjita. So here's my interview with Jim Pesota. Welcome back to Experiencing Data. This is Brian O'Neill, and I'm really excited to have my friend Jim Pesota on the line today. Jim is the co-founder and CTO of Panjiva, which is a software company that has mapped the global supply chain using a combination of over 1 billion shipping transactions and machine learning. Jim and I have known each other for uh, a couple of years, and they're actually celebrating two recent achievements, one of them being acquired by S&P Global, which is a very old data company. And uh, they were also just named one of the 10 most innovative data science companies in the world by Fast Company, which is awesome. Can you tell us uh, what's going to happen now that, that Panjeev is part of S&P? Are you going to, is the product going to exist on its own? Or are you going to you know, fold it into their uh, software? Like how, how t- tell us about what that's going to mean for your customers and, and the experience. So we're very excited to be part of S&P Global. Uh, S&P, just by way of background, is a is an old and one of the first, if not the first, data company founded in 1860 as Standard & Poor's uh, rating railroad companies. It has evolved today into a company that has some of the best, if not the best, data on, on companies out there. It's got a lot of very rich and esoteric, but useful on data. So we're, we're very excited to, to complement the offering and also kind of have the brand behind us. I think everyone knows S&P from S&P 500, et cetera. Pangeva is still running on its own right now and over time will be sort of grafted into their flagship data product, which is called S&P Global Market Intelligence as a new supply chain offering. The Pangeva supply chain graph has been concorded or linked up to the uh, S&P company graph. That's actually something that's already done. And we're about to roll out a new product in the market intelligence product line, which essentially gives the the first taste of Pangeva. And over time, the more advanced analytics and data visualizations will also be rolled in. In the medium term, Pangeva.com will go away. But I actually think that's probably a good thing because you know, we're now going to be go from having 20,000 customers to you know, over 10 times that many users. And also a lot of the, the data uh, will be you know, used to enrich the, the offering within S&P, but also the sort of techniques and the data science pipelines that we've built are actually pretty generic at this point because we've, we've integrated over 30 data sets into Pangeva, lots of different types of data sets. We'll talk a lot about shipping data, but We've also pulled in a lot of company level data as well. So we're excited to also leverage a lot of those data science pipelines and other software tools that we've built for shipping data and use that sort of more generically across the S&P data sets. That sounds like it's going to be a, a big project to merge uh, all your analytics and your information for sure. with there. That, that sounds like a, a lot of work to, to get right and to do carefully and make sure that you know the value still is evident. Does S&P see that as a you guys are filling gaps that they didn't have or is it more like you're adding on features or insights or additional layer like for example they have every company that you have but they don't have you know data x y and z or analytic insight x y and z is it more the enhancement or is it more the gap fill it's actually both the sort of bread and butter of of s p has been more public companies and banks inside more developed countries you know, there's a lot of Pangeva data in those areas as well, but Pangeva really shines in places where a lot of other data providers uh, have stumbled, which is in the long tail of companies, smaller companies, a lot of private companies. So alternative private data is very popular right now. 
and very unique. And Pangeva is really um, going to be adding adding a lot there. So Pangeva currently has profile from the 1.5 billion shipping records that maps to about 10 million unique company entities. And that's going to significantly increase the sort of company level coverage that S&P has. They're excited about that. But as you mentioned, there's, there's sort of the data science and analytics capabilities uh, on top of that, that we're going to be working with them to, to fold a lot of that in as well to do sort of on the fly reporting. It sort of allows that, allows the product to be really customized for a particular user and use case as opposed to sort of prepackaging reports. That's going to be uh, another piece. And then, you know, finally, just the, the team. I'm very proud of the team. They've, they're have they pretty amazing and impressed me every day. And SMB is excited to work closely with the Pangeva team to develop you know, next generation data and AI products. And you're also, you've done PhD work at MIT. So you've got a lot of background in, in computer science, data products. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about what you guys Started at Pangeva, where you guys went, obviously you were doing something valuable because A, you have customers and B, you've just been acquired. So welcome to the show. I'm, tell us a little bit more about uh, Pangeva and what you've uh, been up to over there. Yeah, Brian, great to be here and see sort of data products and products in general, analytics products similarly. So great to talk through this. And I can mm-hmm. say that we've had a lot of achievements recently, but it's taken a, definitely a long time to get here. And Mm-hmm. A lot of meandering back and forth, a lot of sort of mistakes. So we could talk about all that stuff as well. We're a AI company focused on supply chain, helping companies engage in global trade, make better decisions when they, you know, when they're confronted with different aspects of the global supply chain. We realize that global supply chain is incredibly complex, uh, incredibly opaque, and we sought out to use data and technology to, to help people make better better decisions. Our bread and butter is uh, transaction level shipping data, and we'll talk about that more. But you know, suffice it to say, for now, it's it's really large data and it's really messy, unstructured data. So that's where the technology comes in to essentially map that data, turn it into structured data that is is actually amenable to analysis. There's a lot of noise that we smooth out. And then we essentially package that data in a SaaS product, very visual and intuitive, to essentially allow non-technical users to ask questions and gain insights from Pangeva. That's kind of the, the broad strokes. Uh, I can give you a few specific examples to make it concrete. So we have a, over 3,000 customers, and those customers span across a variety of industries. So physical good manufacturers are our bread and butter you know, folks that are actually importing goods. We have customers like Walmart and Depot, but also folks that are companies that are analyzing global trade, sometimes at a macro level, looking at an industry or looking at a company, perhaps for investment purposes. We have hedge funds and asset managers using Pangeva. And also shipping companies use Pangeva to optimize their shipping routes. So just give you a concrete example. Imagine if you run a shipping company and you have a, one of your big container ships going from the, the west edge of the Panama Canal up to San Francisco. And that boat specializes in refrigerated containers, you know, carrying goods like vegetables. And let's say that boat is only 60% full and you want to find customers that are shipping on that route that are shipping a particular product that you care about and in particular volumes and frequencies. You know, we have, there's 10 million companies in Pangeva and with a few clicks in the interface, you can very quickly find a short list of companies you can go talk to, potentially to, to partner with them and, and uh, get them into your, into your shipping route. So that's a concrete example. Importers such as Home Depot, uh, who's been uh, one of our longstanding customers, they use Pangeva to find new manufacturers. So if they're coming out with a new product line or ramping up volume on a particular product line, they can look for manufacturers all over the world. And it's interesting because in the beginning days of Pangeva, we thought that it would be our sort of go-to target market would be small and medium-sized customers. But we learned very quickly that even large companies, even ones that have offshore offices in places like China and Vietnam, they also subscribe to Pangeva because you know things are constantly shifting with shifting tariff rates and product lines. Uh, companies go in and out of business. These folks are really hungry for, for data. So importers use Pangeva to find 
new manufacturers, and also to keep an eye on their competition. And then finally, exporters, we have a, a bunch of customers in places like China and Vietnam, and they will use Pangeva essentially to find companies that buy the goods that they make. So you can go into Pangeva and look at a bunch of buyers, as we categorize them, uh, importers, and essentially find a short list of companies to, to reach out to and market to. It's almost like, not necessarily lead generation, but you're almost you're connecting a like a buyer and seller, like you gave like the Home Depot example. So, so might the, if I got that right, would that that might be an example? Such as I have a vegetable garden actually in my backyard, so I use this like drip irrigation system. So, and I got it at Home Depot. <laughs> so, let's say like Home Depot is like we want to have our own line of drip irrigation. They might go <laughs> in and look up like plastic. You know who's shipping from this area that specializes in plastics or something, or, or they might look at the competitor and type in their name and see like, you know, is, is it something like, oh, let's go look at whatever, you know, rainwater.com or, you know, whatever the, mm-hmm. the competitor is and see like, who's their supplier and that type of thing. Is that how they might use the product? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So lead gen is, is one of, uh, one of our few key use cases. And then sort of in the inverse is sort of, vendor generation and competitive intelligence. So you hit the nail on the head. That would be a very popular use case to look at a competitor or a future competitor and say, where, where are they getting their goods made? And the reason that, and this gets a little bit into the, the secret sauce, the reason that that's so straightforward in Pangeva, but difficult with the, the sort of raw material data, which is the shipping data, is all the structuring that we do. And uh, we've essentially mapped the graph or the network of the global supply chain. And the Pangeva supply chain graph, as we call it, is the largest and most complete supply chain graph in existence because we have essentially pieced together shipping data from about 20 different transaction level data sources. Those data sources tend to be government agencies. In the US, it's a Department of Homeland Security. Because we're kind of piecing those together, you can see the nodes in the graph, the primary nodes in the graph, are essentially companies. And the, the, the links between those nodes are supply chain transaction level relationships. You can see customers of or vendors of relationships. And you can very quickly navigate that graph or kind of see how you're connected to a particular company, much like you can do so on LinkedIn or Facebook with people. Is some of the data science aspects in, in terms of what you're doing, does this have to do with like, you know, resolving entities that have names that are slightly different? Like, let's take Dell Computer, Dell EMC, mm-hmm. Dell, Dell Limited, you know, and it's like, well, this is actually all one company, even though, the, you know, their manifest maybe have different company names on that. And then understanding that that's like one logical entity and so that you can kind of look at you know, all of Dell's suppliers, for example, is that one of the things you guys do in terms of kind of cleaning the data and actually being able to provide this graph that's accurate? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The entity resolution technology and clustering of the data is something that we've spent over a person decade of work on and wow. is definitely right now it's in its fourth generation. There's a couple of reasons why doing it at the scale that we've had to do it at is more difficult than, you know, deduplicating your Salesforce account, which is another kind of example of this, but at a much smaller scale. When you're dealing with essentially resolving, you know, 1.5 billion records, you could think of that you're essentially, you need to compute 1.5 billion squared pairs of uh, potential similarities. And if you just sort of run the naive calculation, that could end up taking, you know, many, many years. So basically, the techniques that we've developed handle both the scale, but also the sort of dirtiness of the data for a given company. We may have, you know, give a Dell example, we may have tens of thousands of name variations and in different languages. So right now, the Pangeva data comes in six or seven different languages, character encodings, Chinese, etc., Kind of handling all that gracefully is difficult, but as you said, one of the key value adds on the data science side, we haven't talked about the product yet, but on the data science side, that's one of a handful of kind of key enhancements that we make to the the raw data to get it into essentially a new data set, which is this combined data set, Pangeva Supply Chain Graph, that is, I think that that's like the foundation of the whole company and product. I'm curious if you know, you actually are based here in this in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area where I am, but there's a company here 
in town called Basis Technology. I'm not sure. If mm-hmm. right. Yeah, I think they do some of the same stuff with text analytics and uh, more more on uh, you know the homeland security, the immigrations and border patrol. You know the software that the the agents use when people come into the country, and the same issue with like multiple languages, exactly. anglicization of, for example, a Russian name that might end in OFF versus OV, and it's this, you know, Fedorov or something like this, and knowing mm-hmm, that that's mm-hmm. logically the same, you know, person. And it's interesting in that space how much cleanup you have to do. And this is kind of, it's sort of been a theme on, on this show with a lot of the people I talk to is how much yeah. work has to be done just to get to the point where you can do some fun stuff and you, you can actually solve some problems because there's so much of the data engineering and data cleanup and just getting to that point where you can do the analysis and, and stuff is hard. Absolutely. So first of all, love basis technologies and I'm friends with Carl, their founder and CEO. And it, you're right, it, it is a certainly a similar problem. But to your, your second point, yes, the sort of, you know, I don't know, dark reality of, of data science or data projects is, you know, really spending a, a percent of your time dealing with, A, understanding the data. I mean, uh, one of the big lessons that, that I've had and one of the things that we did not do very well at all in the early days of Pangeva was really deeply understand the semantics and sort of definitions of the data set before, you know, really trying to get value out of it. We kind of just kind of loaded it and just had at it from a sort of computer science standpoint. But we really skipped over one of the most foundational and fundamental precursor tasks to that, I think, which is, you know, it's really a research project and really understanding what does the data mean? What do the columns mean? What is what are the distributions of the data? The data that we're using, and this is often the case, it was collected for other purposes. It was collected for collecting, and it is collected for collecting uh, tariffs as goods cross borders. And that data was really just meant for that purpose and nothing else. And they happened to find a, a resale, resale use case for it. But, but because the data, and again, this is often the case, the data is not really meant to be nice, clean, normalized, error-checked data. You just really, we really had to spend a lot of time and currently spend a lot of time on every new data set we're, we're adding and we're continuing to add data, really understanding the semantics of the data before we even get into it. We actually have a whole team called our data science analysis team you know, there are sort of former academic researchers, economics type researchers who have some technical skills and essentially do a deep dive on for really weeks per data set to really deeply understand what the data says and means before we try to start to build a product on top of that data. So I, I, I totally, I understand that side of it, which is understanding the materials that you're going to be working with and, and the information that yep. you have. And maybe this has changed over time, but so it sounds like you kind of took the data centric approach in your early days, and you know, early days for sure. Yes, yeah. started surfacing. Well, let's get it on the screen now. Let's filter now. Let's add some <laughs> controls to do stuff with it. And has that changed over time? And ha- how does that user, this person that's looking for you know those irrigation supplies, or like I want to change my coffee, you know, the coffee beans we import, you know, or whoever it may be, how do they fit into that now? Like into that story, like if you bring on a new data set or something like that, maybe it's in a domain or maybe it's like new columns or new information that you don't currently have. Like, is there something you guys do differently now to make sure that user actually is going to get some value out of it before it goes into the product? This is something that you and I have spoken about uh, a decent amount, Brian. I think, you know, we really frankly wasted a lot of time and kind of doing some science experiments in the beginning phases of the company. And I think there's a time and a place for that for sure. Just kind of getting your head around the data and, and, and the use cases or the, the data and the potential use cases. But where we've evolved to is a very user centric mindset about how to actually build and deliver valuable products. And I think this is something that I see when I'm advising companies or helping friends again and again. And again, this is what we did in the early days. But you know, it's very common to see companies that are data source centric. AI centric, and I really think the every every company needs to be user centric and use case centric, and then needs to have an arsenal of tools, you know, from the data science world, from the data visualization world, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and have those tools to solve the user's problems and tap into them as needed, and you know, know what the user wants so you can go 
you can go gather the data that the user cares about and then really package the, the product to deliver particular and solve particular use cases. But in the, you know, the early days, we were just you know, kind of a little more of a hammer looking for a nail kind of a scenario. And we attack the problem quite differently now, although I would say it's still not perfect and we still have a number of challenges, but we, we really try to be focused on the use, use case. We have a whole team, product team now that we didn't have before that really deeply understands that. And then we kind of do the technology and data piece after that. I imagine you guys probably talk to talk to customers at times to inform inform this process. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. We you know, we have a number of different ways to engage with our customers. Some are very high touch and you know, low it's kind of small data, number of data points. And some are low touch but thicker on the number of data points from, from the customers. So we have a customer success team that is very close to our 20,000 paying users, or as close as you can be to 20,000 paying users, obviously closer to some more than others. And there we have a system, an internal system, of course, to kind of constantly be tracking feedback. That's one way. Our product team also has developed a small cohort of users called our VIP users that essentially get early access to beta features and we have in-product sort of feedback mechanisms and phone calls, screen shares, et cetera, with, uh, with these users. And especially for the users who are you know, really engaged and really excited about Fangiva, developing products, et cetera, that's been a fantastic resource. And then finally, there's a number of hooks that we have that are sort of constantly measuring, measuring data and then we're able to take a very broad view about usage and discoverability, et cetera. And obviously, you need to interpret that data very carefully. Very easy to draw four conclusions from you know, skewed or thin data. But uh, if you kind of put all those pieces together, we try to get pretty close to the user. I'll also say that in addition to, we talked about customer success and, and product, but engineering and data science is very, I would say, very close to the customer at Pangeva. Uh, it's something that uh, is very, has always been very important to me because I think that when you're developing a product, the engineers uh, often has to make micro decisions about how exactly to implement a feature, how to lay the groundwork for potentially future features, and just thinking about extensibility of the software. And engineers are going to develop much better products and frankly, be much happier knowing, you know, and having that connection to the user is much more fulfilling to be building for a, uh, a person or a set of people that you, you've actually talked to. So sort of in all of those ways, and different, we sort of try to touch the user in, in all of those ways. That's great. So it sounds like you have a good mix of, of both quantitative, like you, you have some type of, you know, Google Analytics equivalent or an internal, you know, mm-hmm. metrics on page views, maybe time, time on mm-hmm. page, stuff like that. But you've also, sounds like you also have some qualitative, like, I don't, is it like a chat window? I can say like, hey, what does this button mean? Or these types of feedback mechanisms. Uh, is that correct? You have, you have some kind of like interface like that, or they can send an email right from the interface about, you know, issues. Is yeah. That- Got it. Exactly. So there's sort of an ever persistent feedback mechanism, and that's sort of for everybody. And then on top of that, for the the VIP users, that that beta group, what we do is we essentially build a little extra uh, user interface element to to allow users just to type in their feedback directly. That feedback actually goes both to the product management team or the the subset of that team working on the on the product as well as to the specific engineers that uh, have worked on that product. Oh, so awesome. they're able to get sort of direct, direct feedback. And I just think you want to lower the friction as much as possible. So sort of at that moment, when they're feeling the, you know, the annoyance or have the uh, inspiration for a way to make it better, you just want it to be that box to be staring them in the face. It's not even a, a link that you click and then open the box. It's just a box and then you type and click. You just want to lower, lower that barrier. From having put these processes into place, is, is there a, a story or a particular anecdote that comes to mind, like something that you learn from kind of having these customer touch points on a regular basis? Like we never would have known X had we not, you know, either asked for that passive feedback or, or maybe in an interview or a screen share session or something, you, you learn something, any, any particular nugget <laughs> story? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you kind of a broad story, which is a little bit more of a broad learning, uh, and maybe I can give you a specific example as well. But the broad learning is that we kind of, when we started the company, we, we basically tried to oversimplify and smooth over too many details when it came to distilling this mountain of shipping data into insights. We did that by developing what was called the Pangeva rating. We've actually sunsetted that feature, but we essentially came up with our own metrics to look at the data and boil, boil it all down to a number between zero and 100 that assess the sort of quote unquote goodness of a particular supplier. And what we learned from users again and again and again was that that just was oversimplifying and, uh, and way, you know, not really appreciating the nuance of each particular user's questions and use case. And even if they were all using the data for a particular use case, and we, we started the company focusing on the finding vendors or suppliers use case that we talked about a few minutes ago, even though we were focused on that use case, the, the users just didn't, they didn't have enough sort of fidelity in the data that we were offering with, you know, with a single number. And they also didn't trust it. You know, we, they kept saying, hey, give us the data. You're at that point, we were like a couple of years old as a company. No one had ever heard of us. We just didn't have the trust in the users. And frankly, the, the product that we were offering wasn't very good. The number didn't even work that well, So the, the metric. So that sort of taught us that, and this is sort of by direct customer conversation, that you know at that point, they were asking for the raw data. And they uh, then they got the raw data. We, we built another product to give them the raw data. And then they said, oh, that's, that's too much. You know, I need to have a, you know, a machine learning background to make sense of this. And, we, and the pendulum kind of swung back again. And we kind of ended up where we are, are now, which is somewhere in the middle. But uh, if it wasn't for sort of getting kicked in the teeth by uh, a lot of customers saying that this is not what we need to answer our questions, we wouldn't have gotten to where we are today. So you created this, this Pangeva index. I've seen this w- with other products as well. Do you mm-hmm. think the issue was really that they didn't trust it or was it, was it that the data wasn't available in the tool for them to unpack the, the 72 score that they saw for, for whatever this lead was? Or was it there, but they couldn't understand how you guys packaged it up and made the index? Do you think it was that or was it a lack of belief that you guys could really boil the world down to a single number? And it's kind of like... Oh, this 72, it's like this, this is supposed to be right for me and all the other people that are not really doing exactly what I'm doing. So how much should I really believe in a 72? I'm yeah. curious about that thinking there. Because theoretically, right, it's, it's, it's on the right track. You're trying to reduce the amount of input required to get some insight, like how, how much tool time has to be expended in order to get some kind of value from the tool quickly because you're, you're, uh, your sure. goal is not to spend time in Pangeva, probably. The goal is to get some insight out of it. So I can understand the, the, the desire to go into that tactic. So um, could you unpack that a little bit more? Like, Yeah. So you're, you're right that I actually think it's a bit of both, but I will unpack it and, and sort of try to assign some you know, weights, weights to each of these. I really think that the primary problem was that it just wasn't enough fidelity and wasn't enough, enough for the users to really sink their teeth into to actually you know, answer their questions. The fidelity, I mean, it was on the right track, but it just, it was too far. It was too extreme. And to this day, I believe that even though we have, you know, a brand now, we have a, a very well-known parent company uh, that lends us a lot of credibility and some great, I still don't think it's the right, you know, the right level of fidelity. I think it's too blunt of, a, of an instrument for allowing users to get the insight that we want them to get. I think that was a primary issue. I think the, the sort of extra factor was just like, they also didn't, didn't trust us. You know, I think there's just this, there's this, you want to go in that direction. You want to give users as much insight as possible and, li- and while limiting the amount of time they're spending getting that insight. But I do think there is a, there's a point where it's too far, where they're either not, and it could be too far because you're not allowing the user to fully articulate what they, what they want out of the tool. Maybe the user interface or the, the sort of querying mechanism, if, if it's a sort of a search type of interface, is oversimplified. You know, a lot of people want to emulate Google, for example, but sometimes Google is actually too simple. So I think you can have oversimplification on the, on the input side. 
And then you can also have oversimplification on the output side in terms of how the data or the insights are ultimately presented. You're listening to Experiencing Data, the podcast that explores how design and user experience make enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. Your host is Brian O'Neill of Designing for Analytics, designer, UX consultant, and advisor to the business leaders behind custom enterprise data products and analytics applications. For more information, visit designingforanalytics.com. If you're enjoying the show, help Brian out by rating it on iTunes. And now back to Brian. Do you guys have any type of like internal benchmark use cases or some kind of like way of testing the product with users that you you repeat over time to see if like, are we still delivering that, you know, the quality and the value that we want to give, especially as you're probably, I imagine you're probably bringing on new data or maybe you're creating new reports or, you know, that the product's changing over time. How do you like make sure that you're not making it worse? Because obviously when we add information, right, we potentially add value, but we also add noise potentially and friction. And that's where the design care comes in. So I'm I'm just curious if you have some way of not constantly real-time monitoring, but you know what I mean? Like having some sense of a benchmark where, you know, the time it should take to get, you know, to pull up a company, find all of its suppliers and do X, you know, and we, we want that to take, you know, eight minutes or something. I, can you talk to that a little bit? Do you have any type of process you guys use for, for, for studying? Yeah. That? I like the benchmark you just talked about, and we don't have anything that is that tight on the user, uh-huh. kind of the flow or UX, UX side of things, but it sounds like a good idea. I'll tell you what we do do, which is we basically compartmentalize the, the sort of quality assessment. And what I mean by compartmentalize is we look at it on a, in a few different key areas. And I think it's actually important and useful to look at it both in compartments as well as holistically. The, so the first one is, is on the data side. And you can actually essentially vet the quality of the data science algorithms and the sort of the machinery that, that sort of processes the data. Do that independently. And you can essentially use different techniques to make sure that you know, the, the data format changes. We have infrastructure in place to automatically notice that to make sure that that doesn't leak into the product. Or if the, you know, there are often these sort of breakpoints or thresholds that sometimes get triggered or maybe the model, the machine learning model was trained on one type of data and ultimately that model ends up being stale over time. So we have so much data and so many different models that we have automated ways of checking that certain quality metrics, sort of standard data science, data quality metrics are upheld. So I think that's sort of the foundation to Pangeva is the data itself and this supply chain graph. So we have lots of mechanisms in place, over 5,000 automated tests, if you include both the data side and the product side, that are constantly running multiple times a day. On top of that, then there's performance. That's just like, is the website fast enough? And especially for a company like ours, where the amount of data is only ever increasing, often you hit performance knees where, you know, all of a sudden the data used to fit in memory and now it's spilling over to disk or in particular, you know, database index, for example, and then you'll hit a performance knee and that will, that will show itself in the product. We have ways of essentially monitoring our key, sort of key products for our key use cases to make sure that you know searches are fast enough, company profiles and certain reports are fast enough. And that's compartment number two. And then compartment number three is is more on the the product side. And there, I would say the best that we do is kind of the stuff we talked about earlier with vetting the product quality to make sure it doesn't break. But that's different than what this sort of holistic flow that you mentioned that I think we we should be doing and we're not. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's a process, you know, it's not with all, you know, the qualitative types of research activities and design, they're not, it's not binary. It's not like you are, or you aren't. Most people are somewhere on a continuum of the habits and activities and routines that they go through, you know, to be customer focused. And some, some are doing a lot of stuff, some aren't. That that benchmarking thing is something that I think helps companies like when I, with my clients, especially with analytics products, right? There's often like, the the problem space is like it's indeed a space, right? It's usually not just like here. There's five things we need to do, and that's it. And if we get that right, then hey, we we'll sell the company and go to an island and party or whatever. It's not. It's never that simple, <laughs> right? But actually, you right. can use 
something along those lines as a benchmark to kind of check yourselves, especially as products grow. I like to try to encourage clients usually, I mean, it depends on what the problem is in, in that particular situation, but having some kind of idea of we have to put a stake in the ground somewhere. If we're going to evaluate the quality of the product from user experience standpoint, we need to be able to go and run tasks with customers and ask them to perform activities that are realistic based on what their job is. So let's pick a handful of these to get going. They may change over time, but instead of trying to kind of solve an, an amorphous, like global supply chain in general, like we're going to solve the problem. What problem, right? Like at some point, ink is going to go on a screen buttons will be created, workflows will happen, and, and that can either be a very deliberate mm -hmm. process or you can kind of fall into it. So my thing is like, well, let's try to model it around problems that people actually have, pick a subset of those. And then over time, you'll probably learn whether those are even the right benchmarks or not, but it will at least guide the process and keep it from kind of being a mediocre product for everybody instead of like maybe you actually have a really great product for a smaller set of people. And it might mean some users have to suffer a little bit. You know, they're not, they're not going to get mm -hmm. an A-plus experience. They, they may get a B-minus, a C-plus experience, but you've decided that, hey, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to sacrifice the Jolly Jane persona or the, you know, supply chain Eddie. You know, you come up with these people that you're kind of your models for <laughs> who you really need to sure. satisfy the most. And you say, we're not going to satisfy, we're not going to put that guy's job at risk because, you know, they're our top client, they're our top customer. They're the ones that actually spend two, you know, two hours per day in the product. They're not the people that check in once a month to download this report. It's okay if that reporting interface isn't as great, but let's not screw, screw with the, the, you know, the features and the tool that we know that Eddie is using you know, two hours a day every morning when he gets his coffee and he sits down. It's the first thing he does is open email and he opens Pangeva and does XYZ. Exactly. So, so easy to, you know, get overwhelmed with the degrees of freedom that you have when you're starting a company and thinking about a new product. So one of the things we struggled with in the early days, especially, is the sort of blessing and curse of Pangeva is we have so many different types of users and use cases. And it's actually 10 if you, uh, about 10 if you enumerate them, but only a few are the key ones. So eventually where we landed is we have mechanisms for all 10 of those use cases to get some value out of the product, but we really try to nail top three use cases and have special flows and special nomenclature, et cetera, for those particular users. So I'm curious, I don't know if you'd call your company an engineering driven company or, or not, but for, yeah. for ones that are, do you, do you get the people that are always kind of wearing the exception hat? And because I, I could see in a space like yours where there's always going to be someone that's going to say, yeah, but someone might want X or we talked to this one guy that wants to do it like Y, you know, how do you solve that tension? Do you, do you guys run into this problem where maybe a squeaky wheel and an early customer who's been with you for a long time has a really strong feeling about something? And, you know, I, I'm sure you guys have some internal debates about are we going to satisfy this guy or gal with what they're asking for? Or you're like, nope, we're not going to go there because of this. Like, how do you handle the competing requests? As an engineering driven company, it's fun to build things. You know, folks join the company because they, they like the entrepreneurial freedom they have to talk to customers, to develop products. Actually, right now, as we're speaking, there's a hackathon going on and everyone's working on products that they came up with, uh, projects that they came up with uh, on their own. It could be product features, it could be data science features, but only the ones uh, that are truly, you know, deemed to be valuable to customers are actually, you know, worked on for real after the after the hackathon. And back to your question, I would say in the beginning, you know, it's very exciting to 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 have any customer that will that will listen to you at the beginning of any company. It's very exciting to, to go build something that does an okay job at meeting their need and solving their pain. I think we hastily built products in the early days, oversimplified the needs of the customer and the ultimate product that we developed. But, you know, uh, that's okay because we moved fast and we built the next one as, as we learned more. I think the tension, there's a couple ways that the tension you're describing manifests itself. You know, one is, as you describe, a squeaky wheel customer that is gets very upset. And this, this manifests itself, especially sort of perniciously when a salesperson, you know, is, is on the line with a, a customer that is about to close or, you know, they're already a customer and they're not sure if they want to renew or not. 
And you have to make a call, you know, are we going to, we got to keep this feature? Are we going to build this feature that's essential for this one customer? And it's somewhat valuable, but it's not a crazy, uh, you know, amount of value. And that comes up all the time. And that's just a tough ju- judgment call that, you know, you constantly have to manage. Ideally, you have a strategic direction for the product. It's easier to make the call to build if you are, if that thing is in line with where you're going anyway, of course. But it, it gets really hard when you, know, you want to hit your monthly goal or quarterly revenue goal. And this thing is a little bit, a little bit out there. And we, you know, I think it's great to have the freedom and the dis- to have discipline to say no. There's another way it manifests itself beyond customers, though, which is, uh, which is just internal. And there's just a mix of personalities in any, any group of people. And it's very common for maybe a little bit more extroverted or strong minded team member it could be another engineer it could be a salesperson it could be you know a business development person who essentially is getting an oversized share of uh, sway in the company so i think it's really important to try to acknowledge that and that the sort of natural distribution of different personality types within any team and try to have you know bring out of of different team members and pull out of different team members the opinions that they have and, and try to have kind of a, a more of a, a cross-cutting look at what are we hearing in general from a, a broader set of customers, a broader set of people. And the final thing I'll say is, is another bias, which is recency bias. It's very common to when you, you know, the way we've operated and it's worked pretty well is kind of did our major planning on, of larger projects on Kind of a quarterly basis, uh, obviously reevaluating every couple of weeks with our uh, sort of Scrum style iterations. But it's very common to, you know, uh, and very easy to essentially prioritize things that happen to have come up, you know, within a couple of weeks of that planning meeting, which, you know, may be around the beginning or end of the quarter. So it's, it's important to try to take a a little bit more of a longitudinal view of the feedback you've been getting over time and, and documenting that so that when you do do the planning, you're smoothing over the recency bias, you're smoothing over the strong personalities and the sort of high rate customers and just trying to do what's best for the company more in the medium and long term. I wanted to ask you about you. I know you had recently given a talk at a conference on this, but if I recall that the title of the talk was three things to get right in data science. Is that correct? Could you, could you share us a brief version of uh, what those things were? Or if that's not quite the right title, tell us what it was. So it's uh, avoiding data disillusionment, three things to get right when building data products. So first, a little bit of a preamble. There's a reason I think we are headed towards disillusionment or at least a lot of projects, data science projects are, there's just a ton of hype and excitement around data, data science, machine learning, AI. And I think for good reason, there's a lot of, you know, we, we have crossed a kind of a, a pretty cool threshold where a lot of value is able to be created now because we have this nice combination of data availability, you know, strong algorithms and compute power. And that combination is, is certainly powerful. But there's a lot of folks out there with, with the data set hunting for a problem to solve and aren't necessarily going about it with a, a user-centric and use case focus. So I, my prediction, if you look at the if you look at the hype cycle, the you know, the gardener puts out hype cycles for different technologies. If you look at the hype cycle that was put out a couple months ago by Gardner for data science in general, or pretty much all the technologies except for a few are kind of in the in the peak. And if history repeats itself for data science like it did for enterprise software and you know internet technologies and mobile technologies, et cetera, a lot of folks are going to be disappointed over the next three to five years. So thought about the decade that we spent building Pangeva and a few of the key learnings. I think for me at least, if you apply these learnings, I think it will reduce the risk of disappointment. So three areas to get right. One is deliver what's valuable to the user. Two is demystify the technology. And three is democratize the data science talent. So on the first one, you know, this, is, this one's so obvious and sounds so trite that uh, you know, it almost feels silly to say, but you know, we talked about this a lot on this particular uh, conversation, Brian. And I just think this is, this is worth repeating and it's kind of worth keeping front and center all day, every day which is just really need to focus on delivering something that's valuable to the user 
no matter what. When we started Pangeva, we actually were not a AI company focusing on shipping data. We were actually focused on solving de-obfuscating the supply chain in a very different way, which is building more of a, uh, a platform for ratings and subjective reviews and helping companies learn about other companies, let's say, far away in places like China or India, because of reviews, Yelp-style reviews from other people. And we, we thought that was going to work. We, we saw a lot of inspirational examples. You know, and after about six months, we learned that that was just not going to work. There are a lot of incentives in play that uh, people do not want to share their good suppliers and people want to tarnish their competitors. So there's a lot of incentives in play that made that business model not viable. But in the process of building that product, we stumbled upon some data that we were planning on using to assess the veracity of the ratings themselves. And that data was the shipping data. So we were planning on using the shipping data to figure out if the ratings were coming from real customers. We're going to get a rating and look up in the, the data in the background kind of manually, oh, is this a real customer of this Chinese manufacturer? And in the process, we realized, hey, this ratings thing is not working, but the data is actually really interesting. And at first, we thought it was just too messy to get any value out of. But you know, kind of looking at it from a machine learning and data science angle, we realized if we, we work really hard at this, we can actually turn it into something valuable. But all along, we were focused on, this is kind of one thing we got right, and there was a, a lot of luck here, but all along, we were focused on helping the user get insight about these, these companies around the world at a distance and developing trust at a distance, which is really an age-old problem. And no matter if it was a, a platform business or ratings business or a, a sort of AI data business, we were focused on solving that problem. So that's, that's the first lesson, deliver what's valuable to the user. And the next one is demystify the technology. We talked about this to some degree earlier with the Pangeva rating. You know, we were, were trying to have this sort of magical black box that took all this data. It could be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of shipments associated with a given company and boil all of that down to one number. You know, in, in a way, we were you know, wrapping up all of this technology behind this black box. And you know, the user, as we talked about before, like the user just didn't trust it. They didn't understand it. They couldn't contextualize it for their particular business problem. And I think demystifying the technology is, is really important. And this is coming in to play a lot with data science and AI in particular now, where you know, the reality is the models are quite complicated and quite sophisticated, but that doesn't mean that we could just let it be a black box and spit out an answer. I think it's so important to wrap that technology in and sort of give users hooks into the technology so they can A, trust it, and B, take the insight and contextualize it for their particular problem or their particular business use case and make it as user-friendly as, as possible. So that's to demystify the technology. And then three is democratize the data science talent. And this is, this is a little bit more of a tactical approach that is, I think, just necessary given the scarcity of data science talent in the world today. And there's way more, I don't know the statistics, but I think there's way more job openings for data scientists than data scientists out there. And that's going to be the, the case for quite some time. Uh, Carnegie Mellon just came out with the first really the first undergraduate major in uh, AI, but it's going to take some time. But I think it goes beyond that. I think this is beyond just leveraging the scarce data science talent to actually, you know, uh, build, get products built. I think the reason it's important to democratize the data science talent is also because helping product managers, other engineers, and even folks doing business development understand the capabilities of data science is going to fundamentally shape how they think about developing a product and mapping the user's need into the technology domain, thinking about you know, building a model and thinking about features of the data and developing a training set and assessing error rates, communicating how the black box works is really a fundamentally different approach to developing products. And I think it's really important to educate the broader team in, in sort of the broad strokes of data science so that they understand how to leverage it as a tool, even though they don't know how to, you know, write the code or think about it from a, a mathematical perspective. So the third thing to get right by building data products is uh, democratizing 
the data science talent. Question on the second one, in terms of like demystifying the tech. So I'm curious how you see that line between I, the user, sit down and I have some task or job that I need to perform and I want to get and, and you're, with analytics, it's usually some kind of decision support that I'm looking to get or some kind of, in your case, could be a lead, something like that. How does the <laughs> need to understand how Pangeva generated the response that I got? Where's that line between, whoa, you know, I just want to go to the grocery store. I don't need to know on the screen of my car, you know, the fuel is now being injected into the whatever. And like, <laughs> you know, like you could see every part of how the engine is going to move the wheels and, and et cetera. Like, Where's that line between noise uh, and not needing to really understand all of it versus exposing? It sounds like maybe you're, are you saying like they, you need to expose enough to get some trust? Is it about building the trust that's important and then exposing the right amount of the, the, the magic sauce? I don't know. Can you unpack that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, you're on the right track. So there's a couple aspects here. I think the actual form that the product can take that I think provides a nice happy medium to not to a not overwhelm the user, but also give them the sort of hooks that they need to just actually demystify the technology is to essentially use the I'll use the onion analogy where you you give them a high level view of of the insight and ideally package the product or the insight in language that maps to the way they think about the problem. You know, make it very simple at the outset, but provide sort of drill in mechanisms to actually go deeper if they, if they want to. So start with the simple thing, but don't stop there from a product standpoint. But I'll say that that's just sort of a tactic of building the product itself. I would say that the goals though are twofold. One is to build trust, as you said, and second is to provide context for the particular use case. So in Pangeva, you know, there's a bunch of use cases and different use cases may need uh, more or less fidelity and, and nuance and maybe fields of data or, or types of customization. The ideal solution is to build a specialized product for every use case and the user just goes in and they get exactly what they need for their use case. And maybe an advanced user can sort of peel the onion a bit and go a little bit deeper if they need to, or if they want to really understand it. That's the ideal scenario. And in our case, we kind of have a hybrid solution where a few of our use cases have that level of tightness where we're mapping product to use case or use case to product. But but we have this sort of long tail of use cases. And for those, we we provide a little bit more of a generic advanced interface, give folks this sort of of onion approach where they're drilling in if they they need to, and, and give them enough sort of hooks into the data so that they can understand how to to map this insight into the particular problem that they're solving, be it for optimizing their shipping lane or finding out information about their competitor. I think you outlined a sort of a framework for for products that have dis- discrete conclusions or insights that you know are there's going to be repetitive need to go in and get, you know, answer A for question B as it may be and I've kind of, I've seen that process work the framework for a design work well, where you're trying to present, you know, what, what I would call presenting a, a conclusion first, not the evidence, but you kind of provide that. Here's what the, the answer is. It's the 72 index if you're going to go to something like an index, for example. But then you need mm-hmm. to provide the right amount of supporting evidence to back that up. And one thing I've seen work well in this space, too, is sometimes that includes information on what you didn't do. Like, what information did we not include? Like, hey, maybe the, you know, our supply chain data is a year old. So what we're giving you is actually from 2017. It's not 2018. Or, you know, we did not cross, you know, we did not adjust for inflation or we did not do X. If you know that it's, it's not, you know, list out everything that you didn't do, because that could be a mile long. But as you get to know your customer and what they, the questions that may be going through their head, which you really only can learn by talking to them, you may be able to answer that in the interface you know, explicitly on, on the quote, I'll call it the evidence page. It may not be a single page, but the place where you back up some of those analytical conclusions, you might give them an idea about, you know, here's what we checked. Here's what we looked at. We cross-referenced it with this, but we did not do these things. And then they can start to believe the trust or they have a little bit more idea how the sauce works. And I've even seen it to a point where at some point they may even stop looking at that. And now they start to really trust the conclusions because they, they know what yep. goes into the recipe and they don't need to know the recipe anymore. They just want the pizza, you know? <laughs> like, 
I know it's good. <laughs> exactly. I don't care what kind of flour you use anymore. Like <laughs> I was interested the first time because it was so good, but now it's just, it's you know, so I just I, now I just eat it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I no, we absolutely we saw that we saw actually that exact pattern play out with Pangeva where a lot of users in their first couple of months will use the more advanced interfaces. They'll, they'll want to export the data to Excel and double check the math, doing their own pivot tables, et cetera. And then, you know, uh, time goes on and they're just using the, the, the sort of prepackaged reports because hopefully they're better than the sort of manual analysis over time because we've kind of considered these, these sort of exceptional data cases. And any data product that's done really well or any non-trivial data product that's done really well, sometimes it's going to have dozens of these things, especially if you're, no matter if you're, you're sort of mining first party data, like companies like Palantir and Tamer and other companies that are essentially taking companies' internal data and, and working with it. Or in our case, uh, and in many other companies' cases, taking third-party data, no matter where you're getting your data, there's going to be issues with it. There's going to be delays, uh, format changes, granularity differences. It could get overwhelming to the user to essentially list out every, you know, every contingency, every uh, deficiency. You know, I think it's, there's, a real, there's a real balance here. Sure. A balancing act. As much as possible, we try to use the tool of data science to actually correct the data deficiency or impute or uh, whatever technique is actually going to be better than nothing. But right. then say, you know, this was imputed or this was this was reported versus imputed. And I think that can lean on some, you know, common design language in the product to basically, and then over time, the user starts to understand, okay, if it's gray italics, that was imputed. And if it's black regular text that's reported data, for example. And I think that can help the user just sort of intuitively grasp, okay, I need to be a little more careful with this, but I get the gist. And depending, again, depending on their use case, this is an example of sort of communicating just enough to give the user who needs that level of fidelity, maybe a tooltip can say, you know, imputed methodology, if they need that, or if they just need the broad strokes, maybe they don't, they don't, they don't dig in. I like that idea of get the design, if you could build those kinds of things in. And again, over time, by minimizing, you don't, you don't have to hit people over the head with it. And again, it's, 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 knowing, it's knowing the questions that your customer might ask that are the ones that you might need to fill in. It's not every deficiency. It's just the ones that may be a friction point for them. Like, hey, do, am I really going to pull the trigger based on this insight? It's like, is there some answer you can give them or some information that you can give them to make them feel comfortable with the decision support that the tool is generating? So like in your case, you know, using imputed data, for example, I think that's good. And especially if you can balance the subtlety, you know, in the interface there such that it's not, it's not, it's not noise. You're not adding additional noise as well. So I like that thinking a lot. Last question, we're, we're getting close to the clock here on our, our time, but I'm curious to know because w- without, you know, getting into the hype of data science and all that, but is there, is there something that you're excited about in your space that you think because of the climate we're in with the, you know, the compute power being available, you guys obviously are dealing with a ton of information. You've cleaned a lot of it. Is there a new place you guys can go with this technology in terms of, you know, simplifying the experience uh, for your customers? Uh, whether it's a new feature or, you know, hey, we're going to be able to cut out the whole section of the product because this technology is going to allow us to do X now and we never could do that before. Just curious, like what that, you know, what's the next journey look like? Is there something new that's going to be enabled or is it, is it more just a, a slow crawl and the tool sets get better along the way? And it's like, it's still going to be a house, but we don't erect the walls the same way. They may not see how we erect the walls, but you know, it, for us internally, it's easier. You know, can, can you just kind of speak openly to that? Uh, I'll go back to the user again. I think the really, really tough nut to crack when building a, a product is finding a, a product market fit and really finding the key sort of nugget or nuggets that are going to answer questions and solve pain for your user. All the stuff that we're working with, data, you know, different data science frameworks, et cetera, those are great tools and those tools are getting better. That's essentially accelerating the pace of development. But I don't actually think it's unlocking, you know, save for a few key use cases like autonomous vehicles and, you know, some other use cases that really were very difficult before, but now are actually possible. Say for those use cases, I, I think the, the fundamental challenge that we all face is really just 
how do we use this ever increasing and improving arsenal of tools that we have at our disposal from AI and data visualization and you know really fast parallel analytic capabilities on the back end how do we cobble together a product that that really meets the user's needs and I see that as a game of uh, more inches not feet it's going to be it's going to be that fundamental problem that I think is not going to go away you know maybe ever you hit on a topic we t- I talked about on this sh- uh, show many times before that it's it's not a magic you know, it's not a magic bullet, all these technologies, machine learning, and whether it's faster computing power, whatever it may be, most of these things are not just the pill, take the pill, swallow it, and then bam, instant new business value. <laughs> it's, it's not run out and find a place to, you know, go use this new tool. That's not necessarily right. save, save you. And you really got to understand the problem space and know how to deploy the technology properly. Because at the, at the end of the day, they're still going to log into this interface. It's running in a browser. They're going to pull up some information. You know, somehow they're going to receive pixels and ink on a screen telling them something. How they got, how you guys did all of that on the back end and, and the technology that went into it, that may change over time. It may get better. Could be accuracy improving, but it's not usually a magic you know, a magic bullet. So you kind of reiterate that's right. That typically I hear, you know, I think it's important <laughs> with all the hype that around this <laughs> that it's not like, oh my exactly. God, we don't even and need an interface anymore. You know, just <laughs> now it's just a you know exactly theory, yeah. you know. <laughs> Direct to your uh your cor- neocortex. You know, and to be fair, like look, I, I am uh, I'm a technologist at heart and I love this stuff and I think it's it's super exciting. Uh, I just think that it's uh it's very easy to get wrapped up in the technology and uh, get uh, have that overshadow what's what's the most important thing that we're, we're shooting for. Well, cool, man. This has been uh, super fun. We've been talking to uh, Jim Pesota from uh, Pangeva, who's now part of S&P. Can you tell people uh, where to find you online? Are you on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn? Is there a place people can like learn more about you and the company? Yeah. So the, uh, the website's pangeva.com, P-A-N-J-I-V-A, pangeva.com. You can find me uh, on Twitter at Jim Pesota and drop me a line on LinkedIn as well. Great. I will, I will put the links in the show notes. And uh, it's been great to talk to you again. And, and again, congratulations on the acquisition and, and the, uh, the props from Fast Company about data science. That's really great. And uh, hope we get a chance to talk again soon. Always a pleasure, Brian. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.